are we are all human. Um, so so we're in our fourth week, our final week of the of the ordinary angel series, and and today we're going to look at the purpose, our purpose in the brokenness. And again, I just wanted to dis- disclaimer right off the bat, so we can get the fog out of the room. Okay, this is not about Hollywood. It's not about this movie. It's about what God's doing, what He did in the lives of the people in this movie, the story that's being told. The story, it, it's it's like the Bible being written in today's world, right? Okay, and and not not the same. Uh, please don't. You see something in the movie. I'm not saying take that over God's word, right? But what I'm saying is the Bible tells us a story of what God did with and through his people. And this story tells what God did with and through a couple of people, okay? And it's his word, his, his, his work being shown through this message. It's about, it's about the, the beauty of this movie. I love this movie in such a way that it, because it, it, it's, it's about ordinary people. It's about people who are jacked up. It's about people like you and like me, okay? It's not about some superstar. It's not about this Hollywood icon. It's not about whatever someone well-known, famous person. It's about people who are unknown to the rest of the world until this movie come out, okay? And so, so I just want to encourage you. It's God using ordinary people, doing his work through ordinary people. That's what we're talking about. And how can you and I... Be Christ to those around us like Sharon in this movie, okay? Like God works in Sharon like he works in Ed, right? And he works through all of them, all, all the folks in this movie. I mean, he's doing his thing. But, man, you and I can be a Sharon to people. And sometimes we're Ed and we don't want to let a Sharon in. It's a movie thing and he's promoting Hollywood. And it's not that. All I want you to hear is God's word and God's call in your life through this, okay? And so do I want you to go to the movie? Absolutely. Do I want you to go alone? Absolutely not. If you're going to go, take someone with you. And even better yet, take someone with you who isn't showing up to church because they don't want to go inside those walls. They don't want nothing to do with those Christians. And let God work through this movie do, let his spirit move through this movie as the spirit moved through Sharon and Ed, okay? And so, so yeah, through this, through this series, though, we're, we're, we're looking at some things for ordinary people, you and me. And, again, that's the beauty of it. There is no reason God ever used me to go into ministry. I'm like, man, dude, this cannot be. Someone has got to have their wires crossed, right? And God said, guess what? You're an ordinary dude. you got some ordinary problems, and I'm going to use that. And he wants to do that for all of us, right? And so he does that in the, through this movie. Through this movie, we learn about the, learn about our purpose in our pain. We learn about our purpose in our in our in our our doubts. We learn about our purpose as parents. And today, we're going to talk about our purpose in our brokenness. Okay. And so, um, I want you to understand that that even in those darkest places, I don't care where you're at, those darkest places, whether it's uh, Whatever it is, that struggle that you got going on, guess what? God's still working there. He wants to work there. You're the only one stopping him. Okay? I just want you to understand that. Your your dark place, God can work through. Okay? And he can bring glory through. Right? And so, so I just want to just, there is hope. Okay? I don't care how dark it is right now, how bad it seems, how, how it's like, man, there is no way I can ever get out of this funk because I was there and I know for a fact he will use you if you'll let him, okay? 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16, Therefore, do not lose heart. And so often we're in the midst of the yuck, in the dark, right? We're in the bottom of that valley. There's no sunshine coming in. We get in that place, and we think there's no hope, there's no chance. And God's word says, therefore, we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. I want you to think about this. He says, Paul says, he says, our light and momentary troubles. Do we remember how many times he almost got killed? They tried to kill him, right? Do we remember all the times that they beat and abused uh, the different disciples, the apostles? How many, right? And, and God's people, how they, how they were persecuted. And he says, our light and momentary problems, our little, our little hiccup over here, right? 
He says, our, our, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Let the Holy Spirit work through you. Let God work through you. He wants to work in you and through you. Yes, our troubles are achieving eternal glory. And there are days that it seems like, no, there ain't no way. There's no way this can be good stuff, right? Yet it is. And early in the movie, early in the movie, um, Sharon reluctantly goes with her friend to an AA meeting. And this is, this is where I think we are at. I know I've been there. Um, unfortunately, I lived there for a period, long period of time. And, and, and the reality is, is that all of us get there at some times, right? We, we get in that place where, where we don't have a problem. I don't have a problem. You got a problem. <laughs> Uh, you know, it, 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 we get to that place where, where we're struggling with that, where, where we, we, we deny the fact of where we're really at. And she, so she goes to this AA meeting with her friend Rose, who, who's an obnoxious, rotten friend that loves her, right? <laughs> and so um, and she goes to this AA meeting, and here, defiantly, Sharon says, she says, I'm Sharon, and I'm not an alcoholic. And when you see that scene, you'll understand Sharon is definitely an alcoholic. Definitely an alcoholic. But she's there and defiantly rejects the idea that she could possibly be an al- alcoholic. She's broken and she's not willing to admit it yet anyway. And many of us are in a place where we're broken and we're not willing to admit it yet. God's not done with you. God's not done with any of us. Maybe yours isn't alcohol. Maybe yours is any of those other things. Maybe it's the porn. Maybe it's maybe it's maybe it's your job. Maybe maybe it's social media. Maybe it's whatever. Right? There's there's a, all kinds of things that we can be uh, addicted to. All kinds of things that can be destroying us. This dark place for us. Maybe many of us. Well, we just got done with the Super Bowl, right? Um, and some of us are, are like, thank God the NFL is over for the year. Because we know those people who are so absorbed by the NFL, that's, that's their God. And the NBA, and NASCAR, and the whatever, and the whatever, right? So it's not just that professional, but that's the one who just wrapped up, right? Um, and, and so maybe yours isn't alcohol, but it doesn't mean you don't have the addiction. It doesn't mean you don't have the devil working in your life. So whatever it is that you continue to indulge in, that has the potential to cause destruction in your life, whatever it is, Sharon had alcohol. Hers was alcohol. And it was it, 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 she was living with the mindset, I've got this under control. And throughout the movie, she's, she's like trying to get it under control. And she says she's got it under control. The problem is if you ignore the actual problem, then it will, it will overtake everything in your life. If you, if you don't truly face the problem that you have, the struggle that you have, it, it's, it's, it's like crabgrass, okay? If you ignore a little spot of crabgrass in the yard, next week it's going to be the whole yard is going to be crabgrass, right? And, and, and these things that we, we are absorbed with, that we indulge, we overindulge in, will do the exact same thing. I don't say that wine is a bad thing. I say addiction to wine is a bad thing. The Bible says it doesn't say it's wrong to have a drink. It says it's wrong to be in a drunken way. Okay? It's, it's, we need to have our mind clear, right? We, we need to not be controlled by whatever it is that, that's got a hold on us. We all have our mess in our life. It's just what degree is the mess and what is the mess. It's different for all of us. And some of us, we have a mess here and a mess here and a mess here and a mess here. It reminds me of a comedian who had a joke he said one time. He said uh, he, he, they got a new puppy, and then he ended up going out on the tour, and, and his wife tells him the one night when he calls home, checks with her, says, hey, how's things going? She says, oh, the dog pooped in the, in the living room. He says, it's okay, it's okay, I'll be home tomorrow. Um, just, just put a little paper towel over the little newspaper over the top of it and and i'll I'll get it tomorrow 
And she's like, okay. And he says, I walk in the door the, walk in the door the next night, and he says, and there's 20 little teepees all over the living room, he goes, right? And so, right? And, and, but that's what it does. It's just a one little one, and then it's another one, and another one. Sometimes we have all these messes all over the place, and it just rots our life. So Sharon, though, Sharon, she's working on trying to be a better person. She's finding her purpose in her pain and in her doubt. She's finding her purpose in her parenting, and now she's finding her, her purpose in her brokenness. And, and throughout this, she does this, she does this fundraiser at her hair salon, and, and she does a fundraiser for Ed and, and the girls and, and, and for Michelle's surgery and all the medical bills and all that. She does this fundraiser. She comes over to their house to give them the money. They don't even know she did it, right? And so just out of her heart, she just does this, and, and, and they go over, she goes over to their house, gives them the money, and, and uh, um, after she hands them the money, um, Ed's mom is there, and she's helping a lot, and, and she's there, and she says, she invites her to stay for dinner. <laughs> and, and Ed grabs <laughs> mom and says, what are you doing? I've seen this woman. She's a mess. And you know, his mom said, pats him on the arm. She goes, that's okay, honey. She'll fit right in. <laughs> We're all a mess, and it's okay. We'll get there. We just don't want to stay there, right? She'll fit right in. She'll fit right in. Uh, Psalm 51, verse 17. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, you, God, will not despise. That's David wrote that. And, and David says, man, he says, man, my, 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 my sacrifice is a broken spirit, Lord. You won't forsake me. You won't despise me with my, with my broken and contrite heart. Wouldn't it be great if we would admit to our brokenness, we'd admit to God our, our, our failings, our shortcomings, right? Our, our, our broken spirit, if we'd admit to him sooner rather than later. But all too often we end up waiting until later we, or never, right? And so, so, man, what a beautiful, I mean, man, maturity is, is maturity i mean we, we as we mature in our walk we, we can we sometimes we start rationalizing things right sometimes we start rationalizing things and and but the reality is is, is that um we need to realize some things rather than rationalize some things we need to realize our brokenness we need to realize our struggle our challenge we need to realize it rather than rationalize it and say well but it's okay because of this or that right and so it, there was someone uh, said one time, I heard this, this quote at, at one of uh, a gathering that I was at. It said, if you're not the worst sinner you know, then maybe you're not being honest. And some of you are like, wait, no, but what about? Okay, now you're judging. <laughs> oh, I'm not sinful. Now you're lying. Okay, so just go ahead, keep on. <laughs> and, and if we're being honest, we should be the worst sinner we know. We are the worst sinner we know. King David wrote Psalm 51 um, uh, while he was as as the beloved king of, of, of Israel, right? And, and he was a man uh, in his glory, right? And so God um, said that David was a man after his own heart. Remember that? And so, so but, but if we go back to 2 Samuel 11 and 12, if we go back there and, and, and uh, we, we look at the cause of, of David's brokenness and his guilt that, he, that he, he talks about for the sacrifice, right? We look at the cause of that, and, and short version is, I won't read through all of it, right? Short version's this, okay? So David, um, one night he's, he's at his palace. His armies are off fighting. Um, normally the king would be out there with them in that day, not like today our president sits in the White House and the men on the battlefield are on their own, right? Um, it, it, he, the king in that day normally was out there at the battlefield. And so, but David, in his comfort, had come back to the palace and was staying in, in, in town, hanging out, right? And so he's at the palace, he can't sleep. He goes for a walk out on, on the rooftop, which the palace was always built on the hill, right? Because it oversees everything because the king needs to see what he rules over, right? And so he can see the entire city below him, right? And so he's, as he goes out for this walk in the, in the evening, in the night that he can't sleep, he sees a woman bathing and he lusts after her and he inquires about who she is and he calls her. 
to come to his palace, and in that day you didn't refuse the king. You'd get your head taken off pretty fast if you did. So she comes, he commits adultery with Bathsheba. You've probably now that might be a little more familiar. Okay, he commits adultery with her. Not only that, but shortly thereafter finds out, oh, she's pregnant now. And since her husband Uriah has been out fighting for David and, and Israel, it sure wasn't him doing it. He's not the father. And so now David has to cover up. And so he calls Uriah back. And if the name Uriah sounds familiar to you, maybe you remember when David was hiding in the caves and he was, trying to run, he was running for his life from Saul and there's a, one of his soldiers' name is Uriah. This is the same one who's been committed to him forever. It's the same. He calls Uriah back to give him an update for the king on how the battle's going. And when Uriah comes back, David gets him all drunk, and it says, go on home to Bathsheba, go have some little husband-wife time. Uriah instead sleeps at the, at the palace entrance, doesn't go home, and, and, and then David finds out about it later. And David calls Uriah in and he's like, what are you doing? Why didn't you go home and be with your wife? And he goes, my men are out on the battlefield. They don't get to be with their wives, so I cannot go be with my wife while they're out there. Interesting thing is that Uriah in his drunkenness was far more honorable than David was in his soberness in this time. So David in his anger sends Uriah back with a note for the commander of the armies. He sends Uriah with the note and he knows Uriah is this honorable man so he knows Uriah is not going to read the note. So he takes the message to the commander of the armies, and the command, David tells the commander of the armies, send Uriah out into the front where he can be killed and then with, withdraw your troops. So he has Uriah, a man who's been with him his entire kingship and before, has him murdered because of his lust for Uriah's wife. So after a period of time, after a period of mourning, Bathsheba and David get married, and they live happily ever after. Or not. Or not. And so soon after that, the prophet Nathan comes and talks to David and calls David out for his sinfulness. And David initially is angry, but then he's grieved. Eventually he's grieved. He's, he's, he's angry. He doesn't, his, his anger turns to shame and it turns to regret. In, in, in. So what started as a lustful look turned into adultery, turned into deceit, turned into murder, and now has turned into regret, turned into shame. And if we leave our hearts unguarded, the unguarded heart will ruin us. It will destroy us every time, every time. We have sinful hearts, and if we're not willing to guard our hearts, if we're not willing to protect our hearts, that sin will flourish. And it will destroy everything about us. Sin starts at the heart. So when it comes to being forgiven and, and guilt being erased, we need to look at that. We need to go back to the heart to make those adjustments. And so how do we overcome sin and guilt? We'll look at David's what David did to overcome his sin and guilt. The first thing he, th that we see is remorse. The first thing is remorse. See, remorse is described as a, defined as a deep regret or guilt for a wrong committed. Psalm 51, verse 1, again, this is David. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. When we experience remorse, our hearts should be grieved over what we've done, and far too often in the world today, especially because of the church today, um, we are instead, oops, so bad, everyone sins, no big deal. But when we sin, and especially when God's convicting us of it, when we're being called out on it, we should, oh, our heart should be grieved. It grieves God's heart, and that's something that I've, man, has really been forefront for me for the last several, several months, close to a year, is, is that man a living, man, I, I used to think, how could you possibly do that? How could you, why would you do, why would you tell that lie? Why would you get drunk? Why would you 
do whatever you're doing, right? And, and I would be like, but, but then it got, it got, God convicted me and said, how about what you did? You're upset with them about what they did. How about what you did? How bad do you think it grieves me? That's the word God gave me. It was, it, how bad it grieves my heart about what you're doing when you're being judgmental, when you're being prideful, when you're being full of Sheldon and not full of Christ. And ever since then, I can't get that whole that grieved out of my mind. That's where our heart should be. Our heart should be grieved for our transgressions against the Lord. Our heart should be grieved for our transgressions against our fellow people. Worldly sorrow leads to leads to death, and godly sorrow leads to repentance, according to our scriptures. There's a huge difference between the two. When when our girls were young. Um, and maybe some of you parents will relate to this. Maybe all you parents will relate to this. I think you probably all will. Um, when our girls were young, they, they're girls, right? They're sisters. They're two years apart. Guess what? They're going to pick on each other. They're going to do things. They're going to upset each other, right? And things are going to happen. And I just remember uh, time and time again um, where, where the girls would do something, we'd make them go apologize to their sister, right? And I remember this one time very vividly where, where something had, been, had, had transpired between the girls. And I, re- I remember t- telling Stephanie, uh, you need to go apologize to your sister. And, 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 and Stacy's just like right there, right? You need to apologize. And I remember Stephanie going, she's so adamant that she was right and she didn't need to apologize, right? And so, so she, I just remember Stephanie being there going, but, um, I'm sorry, she goes. And I'm like, wow, did she really mean that? You know, is she really sorry? But I think that's what we do. God said, I gotta say I'm sorry, so I gotta say I'm sorry. But I wanna be right, I don't wanna say I'm sorry, right? But it, it, I, I'm glad y'all chuckled about that because Stephanie's probably gonna hit me later, but that's fine. Uh, but, you know, but, but I just remember that, she's just like, ah, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry, she says, you know, and, and just, man. And then now, Joel might be going, which time was that? And so I'm not sure, but, but. So we start with remorse. There was, she had no remorse. We need to have remorse. We need to be grieved. And the second thing we need to do, need is confession. We need confession, which is an admission of your being guilty or doing wrong. We need confession. It's admitting to God and it's admitting to the other party. Because we get this wrong, right? Because we're like, oh, no, I apologize to him. That's fine. But I didn't apologize to God. I didn't admit to God what I did. Or, or, but I prayed about it. I asked God to forgive me, but I am not telling her. Right? But we need to be doing both. We need to do both. When it comes to confession, we can't confess without confessing to God and the other party. Not biblical confession. Verse 3 and 4 says, For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. So often, oh, I didn't know I sinned. Oh, you didn't know taking that was sin, huh? I didn't know I sinned. You, 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 you just lied. You know for a fact you just lied, but you didn't sin? Well, but it's for a good cause. And now you sinned again. Right? But we, we, need, to, we need to confess our sins. He it, it says, it says, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. We know that we've sinned most of the time. We know every time I've lost my temper, I just it just rips me up inside afterwards. I'm like, oh, why did I do that again? Why did I, how did I blow that again? I thought I was doing pretty good. And I just threw it all away. Because why? Because I know that when I blew it, when I lost my temper, when I allowed Satan to tempt me and I went for it, I know darn well I sinned. He says, for, for I know my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. There's power in confession. We need to confess that sin. We need to let God know. Yep, I messed it up. I messed it up. We tend to rationalize things. I think David might have did some rationalizing. I think he might have been like, well, you know, she shouldn't have been alone. She was hot to trot, and her husband didn't even go home with her that night. 
I gave him the chance. Go spend time with mama. He didn't know she was mama yet. Go spend time with her. And she, he, so, you know, I got to do what I should do because she deserves better than that. I have no doubt that's a very possible thought in his head, in the time, in the midst of his lust. Uh, maybe he thought, you know, Uriah was going to die in battle anyway. Was, the odds were against him. All I did is give a little nudge. It's okay. As he's living in his, his shame and trying to cover up his sin, and he sins again. We do that. There's time, oh, but it's, but, it, but you know, it would be okay. If it, was just, it, it, it wouldn't be okay if I did that to you, but, I mean, come on. It's, it's Steve-O. It's okay. We could do that to him. Right? We, we make those excuses. Well, I was defending you, so that's why I did. And we make excuses for what we've done over and over again. I, I, I'm speaking from experience, folks. Okay? So you're not the only one. When you're feeling convicted in the heart right now, you're not the only one. Okay? So we have... We have, uh, uh, we need to uh, uh, remorse, we need confession, and then number three, we need request. Request. David makes five requests. He makes five requests here. Uh, Psalm 51, verse 9, he says, Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Blot out all my iniquity. That's, that's a request for forgiveness. He's asking God, forgive me. He's asking him, forgive me. Verse 10 says, create in me a pure heart, O God. He's asking for transformation. He wants to be transformed, make a new heart. I don't want this old one anymore. Create in me a new heart, a heart for God, which God said what? David was a man after his own heart. Okay? David's asking, make, give me a new heart. Transform my heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. He's asking for, he's requesting renewal he wants renewed in the lord so verse 12 says restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me he's pleading for restoration he's requesting restoration restore me bring me back to who i was because he knows he knows he was god's man and then he wasn't and he knows restore me back to be the man you want me to be restore me and verse 14 says, deliver me from my guilt of bloodshed, O God. He's asking for deliverance. He wants to be delivered from that guilt. And each and every one of us should want to be delivered from our guilt as well. He makes requests there for, for very real needs. And you and I need to make some requests for very real needs ourselves when it comes to our transgressions against God and against our fellow person. And in whatever way that is. Sometimes our transgressions against God aren't really against another person either. If I reject God, that's not against you. That's against him, right? Now, if I lie to you, now I've, uh, it's against God and you, right? Amen? And so, so, that's, that's, so we need to make those requests. We need to be transformed. We need to, man, we need to make these requests and say, Lord, just restore me, re transform me, create me new within me, right? We need to, man, just, Lord, overhaul me. Wipe the old me, old me away, bring in the new, rebuild me. It's kind of, I, I think of, of, of I, I don't know why, but for whatever reason, um, I think of, of, of a speeding ticket. If you, if, if you, if you, if you've, who, who's ever had a speeding ticket? Okay, yeah, some of us are like, oh, down low, who, yeah, you know, don't let it, did anyone see that? No. Uh-huh, right? And some of you didn't raise your hand at all, and you're lying. So I'm just saying. Okay, so uh, we, we, a speeding ticket, right? So when you get a speeding ticket, and I have to admit I might have had one, and so, but I, I we get a speeding ticket, and then we, then we have to admit to the law officer, right, that maybe maybe we do we try to get out of the ticket, right? Because oh, I'm sorry, I just I got a lead foot. It's not. Oh, I'm sorry, you know. Um, or, or or maybe we admit to because if I come home with one, Joe's gonna I'm gonna have to do some explaining. 
Okay, so, and, and it's going to, oh, wow, sorry, honey, I'm just struggling with that lead foot, you know. The, 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 we, we struggle with things, but until we, until we are grieved by them and until we repent for them, we're going to continue to pay the fine for them. So until you do something about the speeding thing, the lead foot that you're claiming, which I have, I do have, no matter what, I'm all of a sudden I'm like, whoa, better slow that down. Joe's like, uh-huh, going to get ticket, ain't you? And I'm like, no, no. I'll set to cruise. I set to cruise on. I don't care how slow. If 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 the car I'm in will take will allow me to set to cruise at 25, I will. I haven't found one yet for 15 for them school zones. But you know, because I know my foot is always mashing on the gas, and so in this bus driving thing ain't really helping because my bus maxes out at 60. So when I'm going down the highway, I've got to have it floored all the way down. The ones we take for activities max out at 80. So I got to have it all the way to the floor, man. Then I get on the highway, and I'm like, whoa, better set that cruise. We don't want to stick it in the bus either, so right? But the, the reality is, until we repent and we, we do something about it, we're going to continue to gather the speeding tickets. We're going to continue to gather the fines in our life as sinners until we do something about it, until we request God to make us new, and until we do number four, until we repentance repentance until we repent of our sin until we repent of our speeding we'll continue to live in sin and we'll continue to gather the fines we have to repent and remember that it's, 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 the church has done a terrible thing with this also because mi- most of the church today i would argue talks about repentance but they don't explain the fact that repentance isn't just saying oops i'm sorry which is what most of us do i lived most of my life doing that oops i'm sorry oh god you got to forgive me you said you forgive right repentance is turning 180 degrees from turning away from when i repent of drinking i turn away from the drinking when i repent of porn i turn away from the porn when i repent of whatever it is i need to turn away from it you have to go the other direction repentance repentance is not forgive me but i'm going out to get drunk again tonight And I lived that kind of repentance for a very, very long part of my life. David repented. We need to repent. And David goes on to say this. In verse 13, he says, Then, after the repentance, after the renewal, after the requests, then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Then I will teach when we know, when we've repented, when we've we've given our life over to Christ, then I will teach transgressors, other sinners, those who don't know Jesus, those who aren't walking with the Lord, then I will teach them about you. I will direct them to God. That's what David's saying. That's what all of us are called to do. Jesus calls each and every one of us to that. Verse 17 My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. David lays upon the altar of God his heart. He lays his heart upon that altar. He says, look, Lord, here it is. Renew it, rebuild it, transform it. All I have, I give to you. And all we really have is our heart. That's all God wants is our heart. And when he has our heart and we're willing to lay our heart upon his altar. When we're willing to lay our heart upon his altar, we will turn our lives around. He will turn our lives around and we'll be able to start doing what we're called to do. David's saying, I don't want to keep leading people down the wrong path. I want them on your path, Lord. You and I, when we repent, we have to do some other things. One thing we've got to do when we repent, if we truly have repented, we need to go and seek forgiveness. We need to confess that sin to the one we transgressed against. We need to go to them. If I've 
transgressed against you, if I've sinned against you, if I'm truly repentant, I need to come to you and ask you to forgive me. Please forgive me for being a failure. Please forgive me for leading you astray. Please forgive me for whatever it is. Please forgive me. I had someone the other day, I, I had lost my temper, and I might have dropped a word that used to be my favorite vocabulary about three times in about four or five sentences. I was very angry. I allowed Satan to get a hold on me until I crushed his head again. But I had to go back to that person and say, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. I failed. I should never have gotten angry for one thing, and I should never have dropped the F-bomb on you for another, let alone three times. A little humble pie is good for us. And the beauty of it is it doesn't taste bad when it's because we're repentant and we're just doing what God's called us to do. His response to me, oh, so you're saying you're, you're human, you're saying. No, actually what I'm saying is I'm a follower of Jesus Christ and I should never have done that to start with because Jesus wouldn't have done that. I said, so I just ask, I'm just asking for forgiveness. You don't have to give it if you don't want. I just, I need to ask you for forgiveness. And he offered forgiveness. He gave forgiveness. We need to go to the person we've offended. And sometimes they won't see that they were offended. We need to go to them and let them know, I'm, man, I'm sorry, I'm turning from it. And that might be your spouse that might be your child. Billy, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I spent so much time on social media and I've ignored you. I'm sorry I failed you. I haven't been the father to you that I'm supposed to have been. I'm sorry that I blew you up. I'm sorry that I, I, I've been boozing it up all the time or using drugs all the time or whatever it is. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I promise. I won't, I, I'll call now and go. I'll go to treatment right now, right? And we need to repent of whether it's to our spouse or our child or our neighbor, we need to repent of what we've done and we need to ask for forgiveness. They may not give it. That's okay. But we need to do what God's called us to do and his scriptures tells us that we're to, we're to ask for that forgiveness. We're to make amends with our brothers and sisters. As, as followers of Jesus Christ, we can either choose to remain broken or we can choose to be healed and made new. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we have opportunity to be able to come together with other followers of Jesus Christ to help hold us accountable, and therein lies so much of the problem. I don't want to go to church because then people there, they like, um, they like to listen to what God says and stuff, and then I can't do the stuff I want to do because it's fun. And I don't mean to be mocking, but the reality is that's how we live. Because we claim the name, so now we don't have to live the life. And so we don't show up in service because, well, they know I was out partying and I got drunk last night. They know I was dancing in the bar last night. They know what I was doing. And so if I go there, someone's going to say something. They're going to guilt me. And most of the time, you know what I find is interesting because I live this life. Most of the time, they had no idea what I really did. They had no clue that I was drunk and stupid and puking all over and whatever it was I was doing. They didn't know the jokes I'd been telling. But when I went and I was around other fellow Christians, guess what? The Holy Spirit's amazing. Because I thought they knew. But it wasn't them convicting me. It was the Holy Spirit convicting me. And it was until I was willing to repent and actually turn from it. It was until then. Man, otherwise it was just constantly, just constantly thinking that everyone's looking at me. Everyone's looking at me. James 5.16, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so, so that you may be healed. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so when I confess my sins to you, you should be praying for me and I should be praying for you. Which is when we're with brothers and sisters in Christ, that's what we should be doing. And when they're actually following Jesus, that's what will happen. See, it's, 
I don't know if you know much about the, the redwoods in Northern California. Have you ever seen them or pictures of them? They're massive, right? They're 200, 300 feet tall, right? These big old redwoods. This, I mean, some of them, they got like carve out an arch for cars to drive through. They're huge, right? And so they're just massive. And, and, but the interesting thing about the redwoods, they grow about, they say about 10 feet a day or 10 feet a year, I mean, um, up until they get to full maturity. Interesting thing is redwoods are a little different than what, what most trees are. See, these massive giants are, most trees, what you see up top, this, this, this canopy of branch and leaves, that's the same thing as what's under the ground. Normally, there's a root ball that is the same, basically uh, approximately the same size as what the branches and leaves are. Redwoods are different. Redwoods have a shallow root system, and they reach out, and they intertwine with the redwoods around them. And so they entangle with it, so they actually literally support each other. So when the wind blows, it's not just trying to blow the root system of this redwood, but it's trying to blow the root system of all these redwoods. And to go even a step further, something else that redwoods do that, that, that they've found is, is that a redwood, if there's one redwood that is sick, it's, 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 it's uh, 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 got something going on with it, it's not well, uh, the other redwoods can sense that. And through the root systems that are all intertwined, through the root systems, they found that the red, this redwood over here and that one over here, they will send nutrients and health to the one that's sick to help heal the one that's sick, to keep it alive. That's a picture of the church, what the church is supposed to be. That's what the church is supposed to be. That's what we're called to be. Sharon has this friend that, 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 that is a redwood for her. This rose is a redwood for her. Even though Sharon is sick in her alcoholism, even though she's sick and she's trying to hide, she's trying to heal it by doing this whole serving, volunteering thing, right? She's trying to pour into this family, finding her purpose in this family, and, and, and yet she's on the inside, she's still sick. She hasn't done anything within the heart, and she certainly hasn't gone here yet. And so Rose, though, still loves her, still is constantly pouring into her, trying to help her out with this alcoholism, still trying to, to, to heal her through a connected root system. And when we, we've got our struggles and we've got our, our, our brokenness, we need brothers and sisters to connect with us at the root, at Christ. We need brothers and sisters to connect with us in that, to help us become healthier, to help us become stronger when the winds of life are trying to blow us over, when the storms are coming through, to help hold us up and stabilize us. There's a There's a... Um, in the in the film, there's there's a point where um, Sharon's been working really hard trying to help Ed. Michelle's the sick daughter, and I lost the other daughter's name. <laughs> um, and but Ed and his two daughters, he, she's been pouring into him, pouring into him, pouring into him, and and yet, uh, on the inside, the alcohol still remains a problem for her. And I want you to just ch ch check this out. Check this out. There's a common statement between recovery groups. You're only as only as sick as your secrets. Sharon was as sick as her secret. I don't know what your secret is. I don't know what your your struggle is that you don't want to admit to anyone. But you have to admit your brokenness before there can be healing. You have to admit your brokenness before there can be restoration. You have to admit your brokenness before your requests can be fulfilled. In 2013, there was a word that became part of Webster's Dictionary and part of our vocabulary. This world teaches us over and over again that we need to take care of yourself, do for yourself, look out for yourself, 
It's about yourself. And in 2013, Webster added the word selfie to the dictionary. Everyone knows what a selfie is. Everyone, you can see it anywhere you go. Uh, I'm thankful I've never seen a selfie here in the sanctuary. Well, it's about the only place it isn't. And sadly, I wish that was the place it was being happening. If you're going to do it, right? But the reality is selfie is all about, look at my food, check out my food, this is my food. Here, check me out. There's this beautiful sunset. Oh, I've got to be in the picture. There's this incredible, beautiful mountain range God created. Oh, I've got to be in the picture. Hey, check this out. Oh, come, come be in this selfie with me. You know why we call it a selfie? Because narcissistic is too hard to spell. Because reality is we're narcissists. It's all about a check us out. Hey, come on over here. Get, get, let's take a narcissist together. Come on. Right? That's what it is. It's about self. The world we live in promotes self. Everything this world teaches us is about self. What can I do for myself? I want what I want. I want everything for Myself. Sharon and King David both started started trying to find their purpose, trying to find their healing, excuse me, trying to find their healing within themselves. Do it self, as my daughter said, the other daughter said, as a child. Right? Do it self. And and they tried to do it self over and over again. And then, and then then eventually they turned outward, right, through through wise counsel, through loved ones, uh, through Rose and through Nathan. Eventually they turned outward for that counsel, but the problem was never able to be healed, the brokenness never able to be mended until they turned upward to the Lord, until they came to God. And that's where we're all at. We tend to do self, do it self. We don't want to admit. We can't admit. We have CR here, right? And so on, on, on Tuesday nights, there's, depending on the week, nowadays there's about 10, 11 people here, okay? And so, but the, you know what I know? There's a ton more people in this community, and it's, I've had many people tell me, they're going to come, they're going to come. I need to, I need to. Problem is, they don't want to turn to outward. They want to stay inward and stay at self, and I want to take care of self, and I'm going to do it myself and choose to reject what God's got around here, the wise counsel, this person to come alongside, the Rose and the Nathan, we tend to reject that. Or maybe we'll have one, yet we just reject everything they say. And it's not until we turn upward, turn to the Lord, that we can truly heal. And I believe that if people would get out of self, and at least go to the outward, to the Nathan and the Rose, if they'd at least go there, I contend this room would be full on Tuesday nights. And that's not for me, and that's not for Celebrate. That's for them, for those who are struggling, those who are stuck in self. It's for them, for their healing, for their restoration, their reformation. God wants us to, to come to him. He wants us to turn to him. That's, the, that's where we should be going all the time. We rationalize our addictions and our, and our selfish, sinful ways, but you know, uh, we, we use that excuse, nobody's perfect. The world, the church in the world today has all this stuff about, you know, um, you know it, it, just forgiveness, okay? Just, just, to re, just say you're sorry. It's all you got to do. Just say you're sorry. But the church today doesn't preach repentance. They don't teach turn from the sin. Turn yourself around. Not yourself by yourself, but yourself through brothers and sisters, through the Lord. The reality is, as a follower of Jesus Christ, this month I should look more like Christ than I did last month. As a follower of Jesus Christ, this month I should look, today I should look 
much more like Christ than I did a year ago. As a follower of Christ, today I should look way different and transformed than I did five years ago. We cannot be a follower of Jesus Christ and not be transformed. And it's not all necessarily all at once, but over time. See, as a follower of Jesus Christ, we won't become sinless, but we will sin less when we're a follower of Jesus Christ and not just a claimer of the name. Psalm 32 was written after Psalm 51. Uh, Psalm 32 is a, a summary of what David uh, did to present himself as a candidate to, to God's uh, forgiveness. And, 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 um, and, and, and it's also about what God did. Um, in it, in Psalm 32, we, we see David's no longer saddened or frustrated. Um, he's more upbeat. He's more grateful. Um, and, 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 and when guilt's gone, it's amazing how freeing forgiveness is. When that guilt's gone, when we've actually repented, we've actually gone to the Lord instead of the world, right? In these four verses that I'm going to share with you, uh, David refers to his sin seven times. Psalm 32, verse 1. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Then I, rec then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. It had been one thing if, if God only forgave David's sin, but, but God specializes in doing immensely more than just what we request. It's amazing what, they, what he does. And, and, and he went farther and deeper, and he, gave, he got rid of David's guilt as well. Not just the sin, but the guilty feeling in the heart as well. And he wants to do that for you and me too. He wants to do that in your life. And you might be saying, well, pastor, but here's the thing. You know, I did some stuff. I'm like, yeah, me too. And if, you, if we've had this conversation, you know. But I've done some very not good stuff. Me too. I've shared with you multiple times. The only thing I didn't do was kill anyone. Otherwise, I broke all nine of the other commandments. I thought I was going to hell for sure before I come to be a follower of Jesus Christ. When I was just claiming the name. And it was only the only reason I didn't kill anyone was by the grace of God. Because he's the one who stopped the one man that I beat up from dying. He's the one who prevented that. Right? I get it that you got some stuff that you've done. I have too. God restored me and he wants to restore you. He restored David and he wants to restore you. He restored uh, uh, Sharon and he wants to restore you. He restored Ed and he wants to restore you. The, the, the thing is, do, are we willing to be restored? We all know John 3.16 where it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish and have eternal life, right? But do we read on to number 17, uh, verse 17 where it says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That the world, God wants to save every one of us. He wants every one of us to be redeemed, but we can't do it until he can't do it until we repent. He can't do it till we confess. He can't do it till we request. He can't do it until we do what we're called to do. Until we until we repent and turn away from the world that we're so in love with. Until we're willing to turn to him. First Peter 1 verse 3 says, in, the, in his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. God wants to give you his life. He wants to atone your life. He wants to restore your life. He wants to re, uh, re, re, totally rebuild your life. He wants to, he wants to answer your requests. But are you willing to repent 
Are you willing to confess? Are you willing to turn from the ways of this world? Are you willing to? Today, I'm asking you, will you? Will today you finally turn away from whatever that is you've been wallowing in, that thing you've been holding on to so tight in this world? Will today, will you give that up? Will you instead grasp for Jesus Christ who spread his arms for you and for me? Father God, Father God, I thank you so much. I thank you for 